You're listening to the AfterBuzz TV Network. Now the largest new media platform on the web and your number one source for after-show entertainment. Very good, The AfterBuzz Studios in Los Angeles, California. Presented by Maria Menounos and streaming live thanks to Akamai Technologies. This is AfterBuzz TV's Salem After Show. We'll break down tonight's episode and get you all the latest news and gossip. And now, another post-game wrap-up show for your favorite TV show. It's AfterBuzz TV's Salem After Show. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Salem After Show right here on AfterBuzz TV. We are talking, of course, about episode six, The Red Rose and The Briar. I am Bobby DeMiro, excited to be joining you guys yet again today for another great episode. We've got a special treat. Anna Koppel's here like usual, Jesse Owens like here like usual, and Marissa Serafini sitting on the panel instead of engineering today. Hello. I love it. Hello, everyone. All right, guys, let's get into this. Um, disclaimer for you guys at home, Jesse and Anna and I have some very strong opinions about this show today uh, that we will be looking looking forward to uh, divulging. I think it's a little controversial. So, so I'll just open it up right now. Did you guys like today's episode? Before we get into specifics, yes or no, what'd you think? I will say yes, because we got a lot of backstory of Mary. And, and I find Mary a very pivotal character in the show, obviously, and she's very intriguing, and to know where she's coming from, just more backstories adds more layers to her, which makes her more intriguing. It makes me want to watch her character even more. Yeah. Um, I have mixed feelings about it. I, I like some parts, but some parts I was like, really? I don't want to give too much away, but I will just say one word. Zombies. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We have zombies, y'all. I think that's what I yelled out when that happened. Uh, yeah, I have mixed feelings, too. Um, yeah, Marissa, I totally agree. I love Mary's backstory. I'm so excited to see that. And I finally, finally, I've really been wanting to hear it. And I'm so glad that we got to get all of it at once. And we didn't just have bits and pieces throughout the season or seasons, even. So I was really excited for that. I did not care for the zombies. I really want this to be a show about witches. Yeah. And uh, I feel that that's a common mistake that a lot of supernatural shows will do, that they'll start out as like, oh, this is a show about vampires, and then we'll throw in whatever. Anyway, um, and then I also thought there were just some, just a lot of moments that I just wasn't crazy about it and just was not up to par with with the, all of the other episodes so far. However, I am super excited for next week's episode. It looks like it's just right back on track and amazing. And I don't know, it's just like a weird little dip for them. Well, and, and let's start with Mary's backstory because I think that's one thing all four of us probably do agree on is that was phenomenal. It was well done. It was interesting. It was important to get her uh, life with George Sibley after John left because it's something we haven't had yet. So starting out with Mary and that backstory and really Mercy with all that, um, the first thing we see with involving these characters is Mercy feasting in Mary's home and Titaba looking over her, and that establishes a relationship for us because Titaba does not like Mercy, doesn't like her throughout the episode with what happens at the end. Why is Titaba so threatened by Mercy? Is it just she doesn't want a competitor to get to Mary? I think it might be that because we know Titaba was, in a way, Mary's mentor, and then Mary's taken on her own prodigy type of child so it might be just like that threat of her authorities getting questioned and having another person into this modern witchcraft that they're into I don't think Tidba and especially how Mary's been behaving towards Tidba in the last few episodes they're Mary and Tidba they're kind of separating and we can see that and Tidba's not agreeing with everything Mary's doing well there's a there's a lot that's uh, that we learned I get be as far as I knew, as far as I was definitely under the impression that Tichaba brought Mary into this world completely, but we learned tonight that it was actually Rose, that Rose brought Mary into this, and uh, so I don't really understand what Tichaba's role has been. Yeah, but Tichaba's been there since the beginning, too, so in a way, she's been kind of a mentor as well. And I think it was both of them who brought her in, so you're right to think that Tittaba brought Mary in because she logistically, physically did that scene with the baby in the woods. That was Tittaba, but apparently the thing we learned tonight is Rose was kind of had the master plan all along that we couldn't have known. So Tittaba was involved, and Tittaba still claims Mary in Summer Garden, so she sees Mercy and says, 
you're not getting my girl, you know, mm -hmm. from the start mm -hmm. of the episode, and then says it, you know, explicitly at the end. I think it's kind of like that, you know, friendship thing, like when you're best friends with someone and then they get this new friend that comes <laughs> yeah. along and you're like, who are you? Like, back off, That's girl. exactly it. <laughs> yeah. I love it. We can relate these to episodes of, like, reality TV and stuff. <laughs> um, okay, but so we see Mary and Mercy then, and and another scene that stuck out to me at the start was, because this establishes another thing that's going to go through the episode, was Mary shaving George Sibley with the big razor, with the straight razor, and telling Mercy about, you know, exposing, what did she say, exposing his throat to my blade and how dangerous that was, and then that blade is going to come back later. Um, mm -hmm. From there, the interesting thing then is the story time. And we learn about Mary's backstory, which is good for us. It's also good for Mercy because Mary tells a supposed story about a prince and a princess and a king. And we Ashley. know it's actually about Mary. Yeah. Come on. No, she's not fooling anybody. But it's good to see that. The one thing that stands out to me, I don't know if you guys caught this, but Janet Montgomery's look. When Mercy said, I can't read, my dad didn't want me to read, you know, he, he read to me and then my husband was going to read to me. Did you notice like that cold, you got to be kidding me stare from Janet Montgomery? <laughs> that was, that to me was her saying, you know, your dad is, I can't probably say the words on the show right now, but she thought very little of that idea. And that is a, an interesting dynamic, I think, in Puritan culture in 1692 for this show to do, because women did not have power although Mary has a lot in this show, but women didn't have power, and Mary sees something where a dad takes control of a daughter and says, you can't read, I read to you, and Mary kind of goes a little very discreetly feminist there and, and gives a look that says to yeah. me something like, that's ridiculous, you are more powerful than him, and sets that table. But also at that time period, were women more educated than men? I think men were more educated. Uh, without a doubt. Time. And it was kept that the men would be educated and have the women do all the household items, especially during that time. So it wouldn't make sense if Mercy wasn't educated in that way, but why is Mary Sibley educated? What makes her different? Uh, class, maybe? I assume Mercy came from Probably a lower class. class. But I, I can understand the, the difference also, because if Mary's going to take on Mercy to be her student, then Mercy needs to be educated. Yeah. I, maybe I'm reading too much into the look, if you guys didn't notice it like I did. I just look looking at Janet Montgomery's stare. You know, if you DVR'd it, go back and look at it again. I'll probably go back and look. It was it was cold. Yeah, and also the style, because if you notice the dresses that they were wearing, Mary was in a dark red type of dress, and Mercy was in a lighter kind of shade of pink. So it just shows that Mercy's on the same visual pathway that Mary is on, but she's not fully there. And Mercy was so frumpy. She was kind of wearing a frumpy, almost like a something you would sleep in, like an over gown to sleep. She was in the dress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, the... The thing that I have noticed about Mary, and I think this is consistent with what you're saying, is that you know there's this part of her that is still e e the old Mary who sees these things that are are wrong or unjust, and you know women should have this equality. There shouldn't be this sort of class difference. There there shouldn't be all of these wrong things going on in Salem, and she wants to stand up for women. She wants to nurture these girls, and um, but she's also very bitter about her own situation. So so we see this sort of internal struggle with her but we we see her acting it out as well and i think mercy's just this unique case where you know she's in her home now and so i think that that look maybe that you're talking about is okay you know what this is too much and i'm gonna do something about this this is and it was maybe just like a little turn in her mind i think it also goes to show that mary now realizes she if Mercy wants to be just like Mary. Mary's going to really have to teach her in all different ways. Yeah, but also Mary made the comment, you know, I see myself in her. Yeah. So I'm sure, because Mary didn't come from a, I don't think she was rich. I think no. she came from a poor background as well. So I think they're just a lot, you know, they're really similar. And, and that's not the first time that she's noticed anything like that. She has said, uh, I, I Mercy has said, I want to be like you, and uh, and she, I think Mary has even said in the past, you know, to be careful of, of those types of things, or mm -hmm. or just sort of well, snidely responded to, oh, just like me, really, you don't mm -hmm. know what you're talking about, girl. It's, and, and she says it explicitly during the flashback when she says, be careful what you wish for, right. which was yeah. a... a warning that came too late for Mary herself, but is an explicit warning to Mercy, be careful what you wish for. So let's talk about that flashback. We see specifically the dinner. When we see Tituba take Mary up to George Sibley's house, she knocks on the door, the servant lets her in, then we see the dinner, Hale is there, 
Um, Hale's wife was there, I imagine. We know that George Sibley's wife was there, his old wife, and he's there. They're dining, they're feasting, and Hale so discreetly kind of, you know, throws a little something into uh, George's wife's drink. Mm -hmm. um, and we sort of understand how Mary became what she became. Now, I felt like this was such an important moment because I think that Magistrate Hale must feel that he has or should have more power in the situation. Like, hey, I had a serious hand in giving you your position. You owe me something here. So I understand more their power struggle now. Yeah. I, I, I get that. I completely agree with that. And it, and it tells me how well planned this was. Obviously, it's going to be planned if you're going to bring a witch into the fold. <laughs> but it's a dichotomy of how well planned it was because Hale and Rose and Tituba planned out this Mary thing very, very carefully and did the thing with John Alden. Rose will later tell us that she got George Sibley to take John Alden away. But then Mary, to us, at least from our perspective, she's sort of flying by the seat of her pants and says, Oh, Mercy, you want to be a witch? Mercy's a witch now. Come here, Mercy, you're in. And it's like, wait a second. It was so well planned when Mary came in, it was very, very, very down to the minute, down to the step, but now Mary's flying by the seat of her pants, adding people into the coven. She's That's more all versus new. impulsive. But also going back to the power struggle, it's not just between the magistrate and George Sibley, it's it's also between uh, Mary as well, because the magistrate has a hand over Mary. Because, That's what I was saying. Yeah. That's the, what I meant. Like, she owes him, too. Yeah, she does. Yeah, and you're right. She does owe him big time. Yeah. Or, or in his mind, she owes him big time. I don't know if she realizes it. Right. That's yeah. that's what I, I meant. I'm sorry if that wasn't clear. That 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 struggle between them. That I thought it was just like an old versus new struggle, but in fact, he had like a more serious hand in putting her into position, in position yeah. than okay. than I realized. I've got two things here in all caps. When something really important happens, I'll write it in all caps just to kind of remember it later. <laughs> and I've got like multiple sentences in a row, including Hale poisoned George's wife, which was a surprise to me, although now that I think about it, it makes more sense. And the second one was Mary nearly murdered Mercy during the story, takes the razor out. I know she didn't use it because she thought Mercy might have been asleep, but Mercy said something. But really, she could have still used she, it. She could have still used it. Why not? I don't know. I think that's the good coming out of Mary because she's still good, and I think that's still the struggle between her and, well, Rose. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that's still the struggle, you know, the old world versus new. So I think that has a lot to do well, with it. Well, Rose did, Rose pointed that out. She said there's still so much love in your heart, that, and she needs that love to not be there. That doesn't work to, to bring about the, the great right or the grand right. And I... Uh, said I need you to have a broken heart right mm -hmm. yeah so that's that's probably why because there's still I don't know or just the question that she asked that uh, did she become queen oh well the, yeah yeah <laughs> but the problem that's is better. you know it, it, be careful what you wish for when you become queen is it's not all as rosy as you think it is but you know I think you're exactly right it's Mary still has whether it's a heart or feeling or whatever it is they're trying to make her so black and so whatever uh, like maybe Rose, like maybe Hale, like Tituba, who is dark. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and Mary just won't go there yet. So Mary seems impulsive to me for two reasons now. Not only did she bring Mercy into the fold very quickly, which was clearly impulsive, at least in the point of view of the other witches. The other impulsive thing, though, is she brought herself into the fold very quickly, we're learning now. It almost looks yeah. like it might have been a very split decision for her if she still has feelings for John, and if she still has a heart for people like Mercy. Maybe Mary shouldn't have been a witch in the first place, and she's made a huge mistake. And I don't want to go into predictions there, but we know she tried to get out of it already and yeah. couldn't. And we can see that struggle that because she's questioning, did I make the right choice? Did I have another option to, you know, do all this? And also, I think I find it interesting how Mary is relaying pretty much her whole story and how she got into the fold of witchcraft and to Mercy when, she, like, she doesn't really know Mercy yet. They're, they're building the relationship right now. And to tell your whole life story this early on, I found interesting why Mary was going to do that, but I also got the, the message, like, if Mercy really is all in in witchcraft, these are the hard, hardships that one might have to go through and overcome to, in order to be at the step where I am right now. So if, you re if Mercy really wants to be like Mary, these are the things you're going to have to deal with. It, Mary tells her at the end of the episode, you will never face hell again, pause, 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 alone. Mm -hmm. So, yes, you're exactly right. Mary, Mercy may face a different kind of hell, and it won't be alone, but something is still coming, and you will still be dealing with hardships. 
Next scene in the flashback. I know we have seen some hot sex scenes before. I'm thinking about Cotton and Gloriana. How about that threesome with mm. George Sibley, Tituba, and Mary? They love to have some threesomes on this show. <laughs> like, even in the previews, like, it had the big orgy with girls and John, and then it had... It looked like someone going down on uh, Mercy. I don't know. I don't know. Did I you, must admit, did you miss I that? that. I yeah, no, no, that, I that was a, a quick shot, but... I mean, it's who like... Knows? Okay. I guess I do. I don't know. But also, okay, I think it's interesting how just how far they went into each other's relationships in order to get to the point where they're at now. To overcome George Sibley that you had to go that route in the sexual way. And uh, just at that point, that time period I find fascinating too, just like doing a threesome in order just to take down a person. I feel like they had to have been happening during that time period in real life though, and yeah. just like nobody was gonna talk about it. Not that people do today, I don't know what kind of people anybody else hanging out with, <laughs> but like that, that nobody was just talking about it, but they had to have happened. Like these are human beings. Well, yeah, I had questions about it too. Like were people really having these sort of sexual encounters with their servants and everything? I don't know, maybe. But I do feel like there might have been another way to go about it. He could have been asleep. They could have drugged him. There were other ways. Yeah. This may have been a sense and a sense. Why can't I use my words? Uh, Sen <laughs> wow, I can't do it right now. Okay, well, I, I think it might have been also a play to just get George Sibling kind of involved because it seems like sensationalizing. <laughs> there you she go. got it. She there you it. go. There you go. <laughs> but I think it might have been like this is George Sibley's kind of twisted way of living. Like he enjoys this kind of perverted behavior, and I think that was their way to get overcome George Sibley, that they had to go the sexual route. Sure. Yeah. I believe it. And I mean, it gets, maybe it'll get ratings. I mean, it is television, I mean, so we yeah. can look look beyond maybe the deeper reasons for it. But that might have that's been why they were candy sensationalizing the it, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> but either way, it was an interesting choice to do it with George Sibley as opposed to a character like, you know, a John Alden or something in a different, in a different <laughs> scene situation. Uh, after sex, though, we talk, after sex, how do you like that transition? After sex. After yeah. sex on Salem, we talk about how, and we see about how with the toad gets into George's mouth, and we understand now that George is rendered useless, which is what we've seen him for these five or six episodes besides that scene. And then we jump cut into the woods with Mary and Mercy, and we learn a little bit, they mention it about doors. There are a lot of doors. You're moving doors. They only mention it one other time at the end of the show at the end of the episode what is this idea of doors and apparently mary wasn't taught this and yet she knows it am i wrong about that yeah because the seer was definitely like taunting Tidibo was that it, with that information yeah like yeah the that witch that you taught everything was apparent you know so. including mm -hmm. apparently doors or whatever yeah. it was what was yeah. the what was the exact doors. phrase how to make her own doors i don't know making doors you're right yeah, yeah. But I I think maybe if they're touching upon the supernatural because in supernatural fantasy shows that portals and doors that can lead to other worlds. So it might be a reference to if we see this big grand right go down, that could be that could open up a door to hell. And so there probably are many ambiguous reasons to this door. Well, they said the grand right was death. So I don't know. Yeah, maybe. But so in, in the woods there, Mary is telling Mercy about, well, after Mercy starts running, Mary is telling Mercy about how the world shall be hers, and we learn that Mary sees a lot of herself in Mercy, and I think we can tell that when Mary decides again not to kill her, but to evidently make her a witch. Uh, right decision by Mercy to become a witch, or another impulsive decision that is going to be a huge regret for her down the road? She took it like a true champ. Can yeah. I just say that that little bull guy reminded me of last season of American Horror Story, Coven? Like the bull guy? Did anybody get that? But it is no. witches and witches. Why not? Yeah, like, anyways, uh, the bull guy. And then, like, obviously Mercy knew something was going to happen. And then Mary was like, are you sure you want this? And Mercy still said yes. So, I mean. Okay, but let's be clear. She didn't say, are you sure you want this? Like, she chased her through the woods. <laughs> she, like, razored her clothes off. It looked, like, almost like she was going to rape her in the woods. It was, And then she's like, say that you want this. I mean, it wasn't like, are you sure? No, I, I think it was also that that was just Mary exerting her authority over Mercy. It's like, literally stripping her down, making her the most vulnerable, and be like, hey, this is what it is. You better accept it or not. If you want to be a witch, then 
Yeah, and, and that was also, I think, Mercy, Mary's just sick way of being, hey, I'm still the boss here. Well, and, yeah. and let's remember Mercy's motivation and what Mer the cards Mercy's holding. Because Mercy, at this point, could have still pointed at Mary and called her out as a witch. And Mary says after she becomes a witch, Mary's like, she can't call me out anymore. So, A... Mary's creating a situation where she's not going to get found out, or at least conceivably in her mind. And B, Mary has already lost or is losing Rose, Hale, and Tituba. And Mary says, hey, if I create a witch and everybody else doesn't like this New World Witch Mercy, she'll be on my team, and at least I can have an ally from which I can maybe develop something. So I don't know if, from Mary's perspective... I don't know if it was that Mercy actually wanted it, or if Mercy might have been considering a little bit, or Mary was like, yeah, wink, wink, you want it, a.k.a. you're going to take it. You said you want it, so I'm going to make you take it now. And that's why you felt the thing that it was almost like a little rapey in a weird way, because it wasn't Mercy actually wanting it. It was Mary sort of shoving it down Mercy's throat because Mary's desperate, but she doesn't want anybody to know that. I yeah. think Mercy still would have gone that route because the whole picture is Mercy wants to be like Mary. So I think she's willing to go through anything. I mean, look at all the crap she's already gone through. So I don't think a little raping by a little bull is going to make a difference. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> What's a little bull rape? I mean... <laughs> Which she's already gone far enough. Just keep going. Interesting. Okay. What was the thing that Mary gave to her in the bathtub at the end, that little gold... To cover her finger that she broke off or bit off. <laughs> yeah. And it was, it was metaphorical. I don't know if it has special power or something, but it was metaphorical for, like, you can't point at me anymore kind of idea because that was what Mercy was doing, was pointing and saying, you know, yeah. witch, witch, witch. And I, I don't know if it was... A sim you know, symbolic or a metaphor, but like, put this on there. Pointing's over now. Also, You're wondering. if you think about like creation-wise, the 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 big famous portrait of the creation of Adam, the, the, the pointing. So it might have been like a religious uh, symbolism too. I thought because it was you. just like gold, though. <laughs> like, because she said, um, "I see your eyes filled with want." So I was like, "Oh, she gave her some gold." <laughs> oh, so you took it like at total face value for like just uh, a yeah. physical like, object. She's huh. covering her finger now. It's gold, though. I, I, I kind of saw it like an extension of creating another witch. The finger pointing, you know, together. Dr. Serafini, <laughs> religious expert. Yeah. What will you be lecturing on next week, Professor? We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, um, last thing on Mary, because it's actually going to transition pretty well into Rose and John and Cotton, which is coming up next. Mary finds Rose, confronts her, and then kind of abruptly, Rose loses her head, and it's all over for Rose. Um, what do we think about that? Which part? Uh, well, the well... one for me. This is one of the parts where it jumps the shark a little bit for me. Mercy is terrified, naked, scared, afraid, etc., etc., etc. And then she takes a, a razor, a shaving razor, and in one swoop can cut off Rose's head? She's got now. powers now. Yeah. So the I razor had nothing like, to do with it. Now, I felt that was maybe Mercy's first act of initiation into witchcraft. Like, this like a is gang? The path. I was just going to say joining a gang. <laughs> this yeah. is the pathway that she's going to go on. And this was her first kill. Well, in the, I don't want to give, well, I'm sure everyone saw it, but in the previews, like, Mercy had some kind of weird Indian makeup on. Did you see that? The red face oh, right. and all that? Mm -hmm. So maybe she's going to go on this, like, killing spree. But for Mary, if we're, if we're keeping score now, which we are, it's two to two. It was three to one, Rose, Hale, Tituba versus Mary a little bit. Now now Rose is gone, and it's Hale and Tituba maybe is a little old world, and Mary and Mercy is new world. So she evened up the score, even though Mercy's not maybe as talented of a witch as the other three. Right. But Mercy's definitely on that pathway to become another Mary. Yeah, and we keep talking about old world, new world, and I thought it was interesting... Um, how uh, they said whoever controls Salem controls the new world and Salem mm -hmm. will be the richest. I thought that was interesting. That's a good point. They specifically mm -hmm. said new world and they meant, you know, America, but also just using the word yeah. new is an interesting choice to use. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. absolutely. Um, one thought, and I really don't know this, and I'm curious what you guys think. What is the significance of bathing mercy so thoroughly by Tituba and then by Mary? What's the significance of the bath? Well, I think with Tituba, it, I think it was just to show her aggression towards her. Like, it's, she resents the role that she's in because, I mean, she's a housemaid and she she has to sort of care for Mercy. Um, it's a, so, And she, obviously, she resents her. She resents her being there. She just resents the person she is now. She resents her being a witch. So I think that's what the symbolism was. But then later, Mary... 
And then, you know, conversely, we get to see Mary like really caring and nurturing for her. But then she also gives this whole speech about how women are, are how humans are mostly water and women understand that and the sort of like fluidity of all of that. Oh, I, I get the symbolism. I think you're 100 yeah. percent right on that. I just mean the physical, the act, the logistics. Why the bath after the initiation into witchdom? Was there a significance to the bath or was it just another scene? Like, did Mary have a bath? I don't remember. I think, well, no, probably not. I, I kind of, I don't know, this could be thinking too much, but I kind of like the idea of it kind of foreshadows, like, Mary being like a mother figure to Mercy. Mercy didn't have a mother figure, so it's kind of like she's taking her under her wing and, like, taking care of her. Because you notice she's constantly kissing her on the forehead. That's a sign of endearment. Yeah, I, I saw it like that, too. Like, M Mary is now being that surrogate kind of parent towards Mercy and treating her like bathing her own child and cleaning her up and stuff. So I saw it on that same path as well. well. I mean, starting with, like, telling her the story and everything and just all... And they started having that conversation yeah, then after my mother died story. and my father never saw it this way. I mean, just starting then, it just sort of set, I think, that train in motion. And I think to go off a of Professor Serafini point that she, of course, could have <laughs> yeah. made, but I'll make... Uh, let's look at Christianity and baptisms yeah, that's and the I use of water too. and baptisms. And this is the use of water to cleanse and begin anew, but it's the dark side. And it's the opposite. And comment, she, um, when Mary walked in, she goes, I'm glad I got here before you drowned her. And she goes, or perhaps dunk her. Like, oh, that's yeah. A, yeah. Look yeah, at you. You're paying attention to all the important uh, lines. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, that also goes back to baptism. Yeah. We were in the back, apparently, like tweeting or something, and yeah, Jesse just, just took like all the notes. Yeah, just rolling our eyes at each other, like oh. <laughs> yeah, Anna and I were rolling our eyes, like oh zombies, and Jesse's like furiously actually like, doing her job. So all right, um, I think that's about it on Mary and Mercy. So let's transition out to John and Cotton. I'm sure other stuff will come up before we transition, though, guys. Uh, if you're on iTunes listening to us right now, hit subscribe if you haven't already. And if you're on YouTube, hit subscribe, comment, like, do all that good stuff you guys have already been doing. Marissa, I believe we're back up on iTunes normally. We are back up. Salem is back on iTunes. Awesome. So everything should be there. If it's not, tweet us. We'll find a solution. But everything looks like it's up and running well and yep. perfect. So thank you guys for all the comments and stuff, by the way, so far. Keep thank them you for coming. your patience, too, as well, yeah. during our technical difficulties. Our issues, our technical problems. But They're it's back up. It happens. It's 2014. We've got the internet. Occasionally it runs out. <laughs> um, okay, let's talk Cotton and John and Rose, because Cotton and John come together as, you know, buddy cops again. We see this again and again and again, and they go and take Rose and interrogate her. One point for me before we get to that point, the first scene with Cotton and John, when they are putting that mixture together to inject Rose, they mentioned one specific ingredient of the mixture. Do dog you remember pee. what it was? Dog, dog pee. pee. And herbs. Do you know why the dog pee is significant? No, but it, that's weird that it drugged her up when they shot it in her. It, it's, it's a paralytic. Here's the, here's yeah, the right. thing. But in real Salem in 1692, our girl Titaba, real Titaba, not Ashley Medekwe. <laughs> yeah. She, when they were, when when witches were being called out and things were happening, and everybody called her as a witch, and she admitted to it, and they never hanged her because they wanted her to, you know, un unload more information on them. And she said, "Yeah, I'm a witch," and told them all this stuff. One of the things that she did was bake cakes with dog urine in it to get rid of witches and get rid of bad spirits and call witches out. Yeah. So the dog urine thing here, while it's an injection in a different situation with Rose. Um, is sort of a wink and a nod to the real story. And this is what we were talking about mm -hmm. last week, about creative license to do your own thing, but still, you know, walk in that line of real yeah. history, we and like we're going to take the dog urine. So yeah, I, urine was used against uh, dark forces and omens and stuff like that to, so to ward off evil. Dog I how urine, they figured yes. that out. Were they like, hmm, let me just... You know, I thought it was interesting urine. how they yeah. <laughs> like and why yeah, yeah. why I that I thought it was interesting how they called dog piss actually on yeah. the show I'm like mm, was that geared towards us that would understand the word piss do they use that word back at that time you know. it, it it should be said that I believe Cotton I know John said it but I think Cotton said the word dog piss too yeah, piss yeah. is a word maybe beneath a nice clean reverend who's just you know looking out for Jesus so Cotton not that he's a bad dude or a tough guy because he's not but he's slowly kind of learning a little bit from John to get a little tougher so this friendship is having an effect on Cotton and we'll see yeah. later with the hunting and all that sort of stuff. But Cotton's getting a little tougher, a little more manly, a little rough around the edges. With and I think sword. It's, it's a good thing. <laughs> it's a, a good thing. Fencing. <laughs> so what was the what was the paralytic or everything that combined was supposed to paralyze? And it did. It paralyzed Rose. They it inject would her. Subdue Rose yeah. in a way. But 
I loved this little short moment when uh, Cotton's explaining all the things. It shows how well educated he is, and he knows a lot about science too. And I, I made a note that he. This really shows like how scientific he is where he said, you know, honestly, I want to get a look at her brain because I suspect that we're completely run by our brains and I want to see, I think that hers is probably abnormally enlarged and I really mm -hmm. want to see how this looks and if only we could cut her open. And I thought that was, oh, look at this. Look at Cotton being a scientist. So, mm -hmm. I, I have a Just Cotton question. Just Mary for the head. <laughs> <laughs> I, have a, I have a Cotton question. Rose indicated in this episode that she has planned everything, even planned having George Sibley send away John Alden. Yeah. George Sibley is immortal, John Alden is immortal. I don't know how Rose has control over those two, but there's some sort of control there perhaps to do that. So my question is, if Rose has planned everything, how does she account for this amateur witch expert Cotton who happens about town? Because it seems like he's a bit of a monkey wrench to them, and if she's planned everything, wouldn't she have kind of gotten rid of him or not had him come at all? How is he there? And, and an expert, just an amateur personal expert on witches when this whole thing happens. I think they need him because, I mean, look at Mary Sibley's relationship with Cotton. He's kind of intimidated by her. She's powerful. So they, she brought him in, you know, to get rid of the witches. So I think that kind of just puts a wall up on her to where he wouldn't suspect her, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Way, yeah. And so he's brought in to, to create hysteria about fake witches like a Bridget Bishop. Right, I don't, I don't, I think that's just a thing to take the attention away from her. But why would there need to be hysteria about witches at all? Like, wouldn't it be just as easy to invade a town and bring about the great right quietly? I would assume. Right? Yeah. Uh, I don't that's know. That's why, that's why cotton to me is such a weird thing. It could also if, be a diversion to something else. Maybe it is, and we don't know it. about the fear in the people. They need that fear that pain. in the people. Yeah, right. She, cause mm -hmm. he, she said something like, uh, is your life easy? Are you painless? What did, it, and he was like really like, what does that mean? What do you mean by that? And, but she never. Oh, about that. sacrifice. There's no sacrifice unless you feel pain. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, and she got free before it, before she answered that, so maybe that plays in somehow. Can we talk about the black eyes? Her eyes went from like green to black. They always do. <laughs> Mary's do too, right? They get Mine real do dark. Too yeah. at night. Wait, excuse me, what? <laughs> Mine do too at night. Uh -oh. There's something you're not telling us, Jesse. <laughs> She's queen of the night. Stay away from her in October when the <laughs> blood moon comes out or whatever it is. <laughs> um, all right, so with Cotton and John, so we see them go to Rose, they inject her after a bit of a struggle. During the injection, we get maybe a little bit of backstory on John because we see his mother in what I initially thought was a flashback. It's actually just a vision that, that Rose is fooling him, thinking he's hurting his mom when he's not. Um, but we see her, she says, you know, why are you doing this to me? You're hurting me, stop, or whatever. Is there any truth to that, or was Rose just using the image of the mom to make John stop? Is it that simple, or is there something deeper about John's parents we need to know? No, I think that was just a yo mama moment. Uh, she's, she's the biggest whore down here, and she loves it. I mean, I think that was just one of those moments, and I think she was shape-shifting. I think it just, uh, it was an episode demonstrating how powerful Rose was, that she was able to shapeshift into John's mother, that she was able to implant thoughts into Sibley's mind, into John's mind, into, and uh, those are the powers of these witches. And then she died. And she got out of the ropes and she... Ooh, back crawled bit, up that tree. Bit that her so wrist creepy. off. Oh. Like, oh my gosh, that hurts me. <laughs> All right, well, the way she crawled up that tree backwards Ooh, was very, so creepy. Very exorcist. So let's just double jointed. Let's has just, to be. Let's just get to it to and let's throw it out. Yeah, she's not a witch. She's just double jointed. <laughs> let's just get to it and let's just throw it out there. The zombies during that scene. Oh. She back crawls up the tree. She bites her wrist. The blood comes out. The zombies come up. I mean, we're I watching that was The very Walking Dead. Too, the, the blood wrist with. Oh yeah. 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 It's like crucifix. stigmata almost. Very stigmata. Yeah. But this, yeah. is, this is where it jumps the shark to me. I didn't like this. I'm just going to be honest. You can criticize me on Twitter. Do it. I didn't like this. It was Prove zombies. It, it was, it, look, somebody fires a gun. I think it was John fired the gun. And then more zombies came. Stop. Yes, stop. Anna. I need to talk about this so much. I need to talk about this gun. <laughs> because the whole time I was like, who's shooting that gun? Who's shooting that? Who shot that? Because on the way in, they were like, well, what happens if she gets free? What happens if she kills us? Like, I imagine with your flint, oh, no, I have a sword. Now. As they're walking into this, and Rose is still paralyzed, and they're talking about what weapons they might use to kill her, 
don't you think they would have brought up this gun? Don't you think the gun would have Oh, they up? did. They brought yeah. up the gun because okay. John said it's got an, it, it works eight out of ten times, but those other two were in trouble. He okay. brought it up. Thank God. Yeah. I missed that. My bad. Yeah. So... <laughs> No, but even so, the yeah, first feel, thing no, about I zombies. I so better about the scene. I just want you to know, I feel a million times better about the scene. I don't feel better about the scene because okay. the zombies are ridiculous. Because of your earlier point. And they got point. away from them. Like, they just walked into town. Like, it's like, wait, hold on. They were just fighting off zombies, and I did not see them kill them. <laughs> like, what What happened? We were watching The Walking Dead for 45 seconds. Yeah. The gun fires, and then more zombies come out of the woods. It's like, this is like Atlanta in The Walking Dead. This is how this happens. But that's with all zombies. You guys, at this point in time in our culture, everybody knows... That you can only kill a zombie by decapitating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or... Some way, and even then, their their heads will go. You have to destroy their brain. Everybody knows that. Mm -hmm. We all know that. And you can't make loud noises. More zombies will come. In 1692, but, but, okay, they did not in, know that. It's the first time it ever happened. In <laughs> fairness, uh, the, our our current society is all you know twisted and tainted by The Walking Dead, but do we actually know what these zombies are going to? Are they gonna, you know, have all these, you know? Well, I'm trying to find my words. Like, actually execute whatever Anne's trying to do. Not Anne. Why am I? Rose. But Rose, <laughs> sorry. Uh, Rose's plans and stuff. What is their objective? Because right now we see them walking, but have they done anything yet? I think they died when Rose died. So, interesting. What is, what is Rose going to plan on using them for? I think she Do was just, just using them to kill John because she said to Mary, but I need your heart to be broken and nothing breaks a heart like death. Yeah. But it, was then, a, it was a means to an end for... for yeah, yeah. To, to get Mary's heart broken again. But then uh, she was decapitated and I think when that happened, that's when the zombies left and then they all kind of met in town together again. They're like, hey, fancy meeting you here. All bloody. There's just like blood all over. That was a funny scene. Yeah, they all had friends. a moment. He was like... Walk you home. Yeah, well, and I'm like, and like they're all just gonna pretend like everything's fine. Oh, all three of them. Really that to me was funny because <laughs> all three of them are lying their faces off to each other, and, and we know it, and they know it. Yeah, yeah. All three of them know. Yeah. They're like, what are you doing? Oh, I can't sleep. I'm walking around town. What are you doing? Oh, we were looking at the moon or Saturn or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure you were. Okay, whatever, yeah, yeah. guys. But they all know it. <laughs> yeah, oh, and also the 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 whole star planetary alignment. I thought. I found it interesting how they brought astronomy into tonight's episode, too. I was like, does that have a play with this big grand ride going on, too? Do you start? Do certain planets have, or stars have to be aligned yeah. for this to be... Well, it does oh, because of the on. harvest moon. We know yeah, the harvest the, moon, the moon, but the planets, but, like, too. There's, yeah. more, there's more astronomy getting involved in this yeah. whole storyline. Yeah, definitely. I also just, like, think that it would be... That's such a weird lie. Just... Oh yeah, just you know, just two gentlemen just taking <laughs> a stroll in the woods. But the fact that Mary didn't even like question why there's blood on their face. Well, like, it's yeah, ridiculous. Whatever. It's whatever. ridiculous. Because she just cleaned herself up after uh, Mercy just killed Rose. Yeah, so it would have like, been so much better if she had blood on her face too. Yeah, yeah. I was like wow, <laughs> yeah. you you cleaned up pretty fast, Mary. That was a little levity there to have them stand there and do that thing, go through those lies, and then there's a pause, and Cotton's like, "Well, see you later." Yeah. <laughs> you know? I'm off to see Gloriana. <laughs> yeah, that's true. We never saw Gloriana tonight. Unfortunately, we heard about her. Rose yeah. called her out, but we never saw her. She was waiting at home for Cotton. Uh, Anna, one thing I have to ask about that Gloriana scene because you were so funny about it. When Rose called out Gloriana and then Mary, Shane West, when John Alden oh, yeah. reacted, okay, to that. I can't, I can't, I can't. Okay, I listen. I adore Shane West, so I. But it was the worst acting I've ever seen in my life because he like snarled. Just he, like, one specific moment where he runs at her with a sword. Yeah, he yeah. just like he like makes his face and he's like, oh, just like it was something so ridiculous. Uh, and that was, you know, that was only the fault of the director. Or maybe maybe the editor to just say, you know what, let's let's reshoot this. Or let's maybe maybe the writing team just on that zombie scene. Let's get rid of that entire scene. <laughs> let's write something just a little bit different. And the rest of the show was fine. But that zombie scene to me just totally totally jumped the shark. I, I literally wrote down on my notes, totally jumped the shark mm -hmm. in all caps because it was that important. But are we going to see more zombies? zombies? I hope we're not going to see more zombies. Are I they really actually going to be there? Because they they were still there after Rose died, right? There, so, and they're all they're all the bodies that they've hung and killed, right? There are yeah. thousands. Of death. They're thousands the crowd, yeah. of dead bodies in those woods. Because we know yeah. the first thing that, that uh, Isaac the Fornicator used to take bodies to. This one was different from that first little place that they took Rose to. There, There's like the woods. Is, have you guys ever seen the movie Apocalypto? No. Oh, they, yeah, have a scene, yeah. they have a scene in that movie yeah. where there's all those bodies from the sacrifices and there's just like lines and miles mm -hmm. of them. That's mm -hmm. like what these woods are. How many dead people are in Salem? You hide people in the woods. I guess. I don't know. <laughs> you hide people, you look at stars. I mean... They're all around that place. 
Uh, okay, so Mary meets John and Cotton. They all know they're lying. Um, I guess that's really it about John and Cotton. At the end, unless I'm forgetting something, but at the end, there's one thing I have to hit on in the previews. We see John. Yes? Before previews? Go for it. Uh, just really quickly, we... Uh, so Anne has been questioning her father and what he's doing and kind of questioning her mom. And so we have this one last really creepy scene where Anne uh, sort of hears something. She goes to inspect it, and there's, like, this cloaked figure. It's so creepy. And she touches it. Poof. Cloaked, just poof, falls down. Weird mass, sort of eyes wide shut-ish. Mm -hmm. And her mom says... Time to talk about dad. We need to have a talk. I thought maybe that was something like that has to be there for him to transport to a different, through a different door. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. It's like, a port key. <laughs> and then she messed it up and then the mom walks in. You know. And I love that mom earlier was like, oh, it's probably just busyness. It's busyness. And Anne's like, it's business, mom. Nope, <laughs> Come that, on, dummy. I think that's a good play on our culture, too, is busyness. Everybody's running around so busy. It's all business. It doesn't matter. Look what everybody does today. Look how much time we spend doing crap that actually doesn't matter. You know, not to get too philosophical about life, but that's a good mm -hmm. um, a, a commentary on what we're doing nowadays in culture, too. And I don't know if they would have talked about it in 1692, but maybe. Why not? But it's a fun scene with the mom, and it establishes the mom. Oh, it's a normal mom. She's kind of cool. She's just a normal person. She has no idea who her husband is. But then in that last scene... Oh, she knows exactly who her husband is. And I think that was another one of my predictions or one of my calls that the mom didn't know anything. I'm wrong again. This is like every week that I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. The mom's totally in on it. Well, something's going to happen because in the preview for next episode, the mom slaps Anne mm -hmm. with something involving the dad. Yeah, it makes sense that the mom would be involved because we saw the couple episodes when Anne was getting possessed or like getting affected by Mary and then the mom had no question towards Magistrate Hale and be like, hey, what happened? Where did you go during that? So if she has been involved since the beginning, it makes sense that she didn't question everything. Yeah. I like it. All right, yeah. guys. Yeah. I think it's time for a little news and gossip. We got good stuff, Let's too. Do this. All right. All right. First piece of news and gossip. Um, we've got two fun things. The second one's really fun. But the first one is Seth Gable, who plays Cotton Mather, our boy. Uh, wetpaint.com has a good rundown on him, getting to know him. They've got like a 10 interesting things about Seth, and a lot of them we kind of already knew, but there's two interesting pieces here that I had no idea of. Maybe you guys didn't. I'm sure a lot of the fans did, but the first is Seth Gable is married to Bryce Dallas Howard. That yeah. Yeah. is Ron Howard's daughter. Yep. Had no idea. Wait, no, I knew that. Oh. <laughs> okay, well, that's not so like, interesting. Who is this? Is married to Ron Howard's daughter? Seth Gable, who plays Cotton. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's all about those connections, even in 1692. You know. <laughs> the, the second one, this is actually kind of funny. He, Do you guys know how he got his start in acting? How? Free candy. Nice. No, I'm serious. Don't look at me like that. At 11 years old, he went with a friend who, by the way, is Josh Gad, who was in Frozen. He went, That's his friend. Yeah. Okay? That's his friend. Like, awesome. Again, it's all about who you know. Yeah. That's his friend, Josh Gad, when he was 11. The, Josh was like, hey, come check out acting camp with me. Just come for a day. And mm -hmm. Seth apparently said, they, quote, they had a vending machine there, and I was able to reach my hand in to sneak out some candy. So I just kept telling my mom I wanted to go back to acting camp. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's funny. And that, kids, is how you become an actor. Just yeah, kidding. Yeah, all about the candy. <laughs> yeah. All right, our second piece of news. This one's fun, and I'm actually going to get your reaction on this, guys, because we've got a little bit of drama, and it involves Shane West. He is not happy. Have the three of you ever tweeted something that you regret? Never. No. Not once. Really? Even that selfie you sent me? <laughs> <laughs> All right. That was a fun uh, selfie. I actually saw that. <laughs> I mean, go on Twitter. Find that out. Go on Twitter. Find it. I'll listening. retweet it. Uh, okay. It's we got deleted. four. Uh-oh. We've got four. Tw I screenshotted it. Don't worry. <gasps> You wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> We've got four tweets from Shane West. By the way, Shane West is on Twitter. He is at Shane West underscore the number one. So follow him too. But four tweets after he learned that Channing Tatum was going to be playing Gambit. Gambit. There is a new X-Men standalone movie on Gambit. Mm -hmm. Four tweets about finding out the casting. The first one is Gambit, one of the best characters in the Marvel Universe. One of the coolest multifaceted characters. So, um, yup, yeah. Hashtag that is all. But oh, don't worry. 
It wasn't all. It keeps going. There's more. The second one was pretty simple. He just said, ugh, 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 that is all. And then he gave a little side eye emoji. We'll get to that in a second. The third one, Shane West comes back like 30 minutes later and says, working on a new superhero film called Look at Me, Man. It's going to be tight, yo. And he's got a lot of emojis down there. <laughs> And then the fourth one, one. One with like a muscle that's like an arm that's just a muscle. That's Shane's, <laughs> well, because Channing Tatum's a strong guy. I only we get our feelings out right. without emojis. It's serious. That's another yeah. topic. And then the fourth I one. I don't use them. I Shane use emoticons, West, though. Shane West says, guys, the Look at Me Man film was a joke. It was a representation of let's just put anyone in a role, whether they fit or not. Hashtag love you, though. Um, this, folks, is oh. called Throwing Shade. Oh, definitely. I feel like shade. he's trying to get that attention. He's like, pay attention to me, guys. Like, yeah, I, speaking see, of get I attention. Mean, I, yeah, I, I totally disagree. I, I think he's. it like that. I think he's 100% right. No offense to Channing Tatum. He's fine, whatever. But Channing Tatum, and not just him, but other folks who are like the hot actor, will just get put in anything because they know it sells at the box office. And movies are a business, so good for them. But it doesn't mean it's right for the show. And I'm no X-Men fan, so I don't know. But I assume if <laughs> Channing... Maybe if, he see, was up for the same part. Did you find that mm, out? I didn't, but, but I doubt it. See, the thing is, I am a big X-Men fan of the films and whatnot. And I know that Channing Tatum, he grew up with X-Men cartoons, the, the, the whole story of X-Men as well. And he's a fan of Gambit. So Channing thought it was a perfect opportunity for him to play this role. And I can understand other people who's also grown up with this franchise and have this predetermined, pre-existing thought in their head. Like, this is what I wanted. And Channing Tatum doesn't fit the bill of what I pre-visioned. So I can understand why... Shane West might be upset if Channing doesn't fit his perfect vision of what Gambit should be. So maybe that's where his frustration is coming to. But I don't think that was professional of Shane West to do that. Especially towards another person in the same industry as you are. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I And that's, I totally agree. Like, and I, I agree with both of your points. I agree that I think it's a lazy move and a greedy move to just throw like the it actor into whatever role just because it's gonna bring you money. Uh, but it's also right disrespectful to somebody with your same craft to just be throwing throwing shade like that. To uh, to give Shane West a little credit, we talked about this a few weeks ago. He was up for Shane in The Walking Dead, and was I think it came down to him and the actor actually did it, or him. He's one of the final ones. And Shane West is on record as saying, "A, I'm glad I didn't get that part because I like doing Salem, and mm -hmm. B." I'm glad I didn't get that part because he's doing a better job than I would have done. So Shane West doesn't appear to be bitter to every actor ever. I mean, well, he's happy for the other guy. But uh, this maybe was a little too far. And it's the danger of Twitter. You got to think before you tweet. He exactly. said, love you, though. Maybe they're friends. Maybe they went out to dinner after. I it, don't know. That sounds kind of no, like loving me. Like, like, yeah. I will, I, I'll give him a lot <laughs> sorry, of credit sorry. for two yeah. things. <laughs> the first one is his publicist is not running his Twitter. Thank God he's running his own Twitter. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We need more people like that who are public figures. A lot of people do, but some don't. Some have the publicists do it. So thankfully he's running his own. The second one is the use of emojis. I'm going to give him a round <laughs> of applause. I use emojis all the time. I use the side eye. I use the sunglasses guy. I use the purple evil face. <laughs> I could do a whole episode on emojis. I love them. Good for Shane West. Yeah, but also if <laughs> you guys you, just go right yeah. over that. If you're also going to run your own social medias, you ha you have to be self aware of what you're going to put out in the public mm -hmm. because you are representing yourself, and you're gonna if mm -hmm. you're gonna represent something as somewhat negative like that, then that just doesn't look good on yourself because you have only yourself to blame. He a lot. He got a lot of responses from fans who were like, you were dead right. Thank you for saying this. I'm glad somebody's saying this. Yeah. So negative to us because it's a professionalism issue, yeah. but a lot of people are in his corner, it looks like, who are like, hey, you're right, buddy. Keep doing it. So, I mean, we want to see, I know we don't want actors to be negative on Twitter or wherever, but we do want people's viewpoints. That's interesting for us. So when somebody does it like this, we look at it and say, oh, this is uncomfortable. But a lot of people look at it and say, hey, that's really interesting. I want more of that. We you don't want you to be sterilized. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. You let us know what you think, too. Yeah, we do want to hear from you guys. Before we get to that, though, let's do some predictions. All right. Our first prediction today is going to come from... I'll take it. Do it. Go uh, it. I'm going to say that Cotton's dad is a witch. Ooh, and Rose mm. put Cotton in there because of the connection to Cotton's dad? Maybe. Interesting. I don't know. Interesting. Was that Cotton's dad the guy that stabbed in the... In the previews for next... I'm not sure who that is. We haven't seen Cotton's dad yet, so it could have, maybe it was. Oh, interesting. Cotton's dad, the president of Harvard at this time. So you're calling the president of Harvard a witch. Well, at that time, not today. <laughs> at, at that time, sorry. Not today. <laughs> it's been the president for 400 years. <laughs> Shapeshifting. 
I th- I think um, Anne's mother. What's her name? Do Do we know? I don't know. Just say Mrs. Hale. Yeah, yeah I don't Mrs. think we've ever learned her name. We We know that she's kind of involved now. Do you think she's a witch as well, or mm. some levels of she has dabbled in witchcraft a little bit at least? Can you dabble? I don't think she has the powers, but I think. She, or but she definitely has knowledge of what's going on in that world. Yes. I have a prediction based on that. Possibly, Anne's mom's gonna tell Anne, "Hey, we're a family of witches. You have a little witch in you," mm. and then that can make Anne mad, and because she's against. I don't know. It could go so many ways. That's my prediction, though. I'm going with Gloriana. We didn't see Gloriana this week. I don't know why I'm obsessed with her, but I'm <laughs> well, going. She's with only seeing her naked. That's true. That's probably it. Actually, <laughs> I'm going with Gloriana. Um, I said it a couple weeks ago, and then it didn't happen, and then I said that she was going to survive and live. I think the witches are going to use Gloriana as a bargaining chip with Cotton, and at some point, they may kill her or out her as a witch. So Mm -hmm. I'm going back on my last prediction that she's going to live. That was wrong. I'm wrong again. I'm wrong all the time. Gloriana's dying. She's a bargaining chip. She's too valuable to Cotton emotionally. The witches know that. Mm. They're going to use that to their advantage. All right, guys. Twitter, Instagram, where can we find you guys online? Uh, you can follow me on Twitter and on Instagram at Serafini TV. Well, you can follow me at Koppel from A or K O P P E L F O R M A Y O R. And you can follow me at Miss Jessie Owen on Instagram and Twitter. And Anna sends great selfies on Twitter, so do follow her. <laughs> She's a cutie. <laughs> I am on Twitter at Bobby Demiro on Instagram at Mr. Bobby Demiro. And guys, one thing to leave you with uh, today, our question about Shane West and Twitter. Do you like it when actors tweet their thoughts like this, or public figures in general, celebrities, tweet their thoughts like this and are sort of uh, uh, an open book, a blank slate that will tell you everything they're thinking? Or should it be a little more professional and a little more muted? We want to know what you guys think about Shane's tweets and every actor kind of in general. So do that on YouTube or iTunes. You can hit subscribe, listen to us, follow us, and get on Twitter and talk to us. Thank you so much for watching. For the group, the four of us now, welcome, Marissa. Thank you. I'm Bobby. We'll see you guys next week. From executive producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other After shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. Buzz you later. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals. Thank you for watching AfterBuzz TV on YouTube. For more of your favorite after shows and interviews, subscribe to our channel here and be sure to share your opinion on the episode in the comment section below here. We'd love to see what you guys are buzzing about. Thanks again. Buzz you later.